when I said that uh, the reason why we explain evolution in terms of changes in gene frequencies, I said the reason for that was that only genes make exact copies of themselves through generations, and therefore only genes have a really significant difference between the successful ones and the unsuccessful ones. <coughs> now, in order to dramatize that point, in the last chapter of the first edition of The Selfish Gene, I wanted to make the point that actually anything which has that property that genes have of making exact copies of themselves, anything that has that property would do. And I pointed out that uh, if on some other planet, if on Mars, there is life, then I put my shirt on uh, the prediction that it will be found to be Darwinian life and that there will be something equivalent to genes. There will be something equivalent to DNA, which is very, very exactly copied, not, not absolutely exactly, but usually exactly copied. There will be something equivalent to DNA, and it may well not be DNA, it may be nothing like DNA. But of course, we, we haven't been to, to, to distant planets to find other forms of life, and so I instead said, maybe there's another kind of replicator in, on this planet that potentially could be doing the same job as DNA. And that's where the meme came from. The meme is the unit of cultural inheritance. It's anything that behaves like a gene in human culture. Uh, the equivalent of uh, the act of reproduction at, at the genetic level would be the act of copying an idea from one brain to another. And I used examples like whistling a tune, uh, and, the, and somebody else catches the tune, almost like catching a virus. And they whistle the tune, and they walk off into the street whistling the same tune, and somebody else catches it uh, and whistles the same tune. And so potentially you could have the same tune spreading throughout, throughout the town. Or if not a tune, it could be a style of dress, um, it could be an accent, it could be a, a favorite word, uh, it could be um, a, a, a style of pottery or wood carving or anything like that which, which is copied from one person to another. You could imagine a style of carpentry, a style of wood carving that is copied from a master to an apprentice and then the apprentice becomes a master of the next generation and passes on his skill to an apprentice of the next generation. <coughs> Anything like that, provided that something is accurately copied down generations, and where I use the word generation in a metaphorical way, you, are, you now understand. Generation could mean I whistle a tune and then you pick it up and whistle the same tune. That's one generation. So I'm using generation in that, in that metaphorical sense. Wherever you have memes that are copied from one brain to another, you potentially have the possibility of a kind of natural selection. Now, it's a big step from that to say there actually is natural selection. <laughs> Presumably, if we go with the analogy of the tunes, some tunes are more likely to be whistled and copied than others, because they're just better tunes. Uh, they're, they're, they're more catchy. We, we actually use the word catchy. Um, so there is a kind of natural selection that we all sort of know about. Um, various objections have been raised to the theory of memes. And by the way, I should add that I, I only ever proposed it in order to downplay the gene as the only unit of natural selection. I wanted to say, look, you've just read this book, The Selfish Gene, which is all about genes as the level at which natural selection acts. It doesn't have to be that way. The level of natural selection is certainly not the individual organism, nor is it the group. But it could be some other kind of molecule on another planet, or it could be the meme on this planet. Um, I, I wasn't intending it to be a contribution to the theory of human culture. Others have tried to make it so, which is, all, which is fine. I'm delighted that they have. I mean, Dan Dennett and Susan Blackmore, for example. Um, objections have been raised to it, like 
the mutation rate's too high. Uh, the thing about genes is that they are exceedingly accurately copied. Memes are not. Um, if, if I, let, let's, let's imagine the game of, that Americans call telephone and we here call Chinese whispers, where you have a line of people and I whisper a, a rhyme into the ear of the first person who whispers the rhyme into the ear of the next person, who whispers it into the next one, and so on. And the, um, the funny part of the game is that usually the rhyme becomes completely garbled by the time it reaches, it reaches the other end. But if the rhyme was sufficiently short and easy to remember, if it were just something very short, uh, like too many cooks spoil the broth, that would probably get to the end of 20 people without, without mutating. Um, so we, we all know that it's perfectly possible for unmutated memes to survive. But we all know it because we all speak English. We all learn an English vocabulary and we can all repeat what other people have said in our native language. And it doesn't matter that some of us say it in an English accent and some in a Scottish accent and some in an American accent, some in a female voice, some in a male voice. These are all um, trivial mutations, and they're trivial in exactly the sense, in precisely the sense, that they don't get copied from one end, from one generation of the game of Chinese whispers to the other. I mean, let, let's persist with this exa example. So I whisper into the ear of the first person a rhyme. The, this first person whispers the same rhyme into the ear of the next person, but she does it in a female voice. But it doesn't matter. The message survives. Uh, the next person does it in an Irish accent. It doesn't matter. The message survives. The exact words survive. And there's a perfectly good operational test of this. If you take 20 people and play Chinese whispers, and you then make a Take a, take a tape recording of each person's whispering, and you've got 20 tapes now, 20 tape recordings, and you then find an independent ob observer, and you say, here are these 20 tape recordings, put them in order, just listen to them, and see if you can work out which was the first generation, which the second generation, which the third, and so on. They won't be able to do it unless there's a definite mutation a, a word changes, then they'll do it. But if it's just a change of accent, a change of pitch of voice, there will be nothing, there'll be no consistent change as you go down the generations. Generation three and generation 17 will be indistinguishable as far as the actual words are, are concerned. Now, that would probably be true if it's a very simple rhyme in a language that all the people in the line understand. But if they're English speakers and the rhyme is a rhyme in, in, in Bulgarian, then what will pass down the line will mutate very rapidly because all that the people can possibly do is repeat it phonetically and it'll come out completely garbled by the time it gets to the other end. That's a bad meme. But the mere fact that it's I, I, I don't think anybody will dispute that it's obvious that uh, provided that the, the rhyme is short and in the in a language that everybody un in, the, in the line understands, in, in most cases, or in many cases at least, it, it's sufficient to say in many cases it will survive intact. And the important point is that you will not be able to tell the order in which those messages were, uh, were enunciated.